Good morning, everybody. Let me get up, get set up here. I can imagine few privileges that are, that are more wonderful than the chance to work and, and talk to young people and get them excited about science. So the chance to be in front of 1,200 of my closest friends, including my son who's out there in the audience. Hi, Daniel. My son's a school teacher here in Texas. He teaches band, but he's, he's uh, actually got a lot of science training. He may turn into a computer scientist someday. We'll see. So I, I have become fascinated by how humans recognize faces and how we can make computers recognize faces for many years. Uh, since I came to Notre Dame in 2001, that has been my major area of research. We actually, it's part of a larger area of research called biometrics. A lot of the techniques that we use in biometrics are shared between face images and other images of, of the iris and the shape of the hand and fingerprints and the like. Uh, but today's talk is focused on faces. And the, the real problem, the research problem that motivates us is really easy to illustrate. So if you can quietly look at the face of your neighbor, maybe look at the face of the neighbor on the other side, Faces are made of basically the same parts. And we recognize them using a pr process that's effortless to us because it was trained into us early in childhood. So as we were babies, we were learning to recognize faces. When we design computer systems to do that, we have none of those advantages, right? So we have to write code or develop systems that process images of faces that are captured by cameras and make decisions about what's in the image, where the face is, what it's made of, and how well it matches to a batch of faces that we've previously taken pictures of. So the matching of faces between a new image we just got and previous images that we already took is the face recognition problem. Developing systems to do that, making sure they work. And this is an important problem because these sorts of systems are being deployed on a planetary scale. So the government of India has a massive project underway to collect images of people in its system so that they can authenticate people who have never had an ID card in their life. Some of them only have one name. And they are generally uh, entitled to government benefits and the government needs a way to make sure that the people who are claiming benefits deserve them and have already gotten what they, they're entitled to. So, I've been asked to speak a little more, more loudly. Um, so we have a big group at Notre Dame that looks at these kind of problems. And again, the real challenge is finding programs and systems that decide who are you or are you who you say you are. And there's a lot of fun research to be done in this area. It overlaps multiple disciplines, uh, not just computer science. It overlaps the engineering disciplines. It overlaps mathematics. Uh, it can actually overlap areas like psychology as well, because the human visual system is a good model for computer systems that might eventually recognize faces just as well as humans do. So what are the computational steps? So if you had to write code, develop a system to do recognition of faces, how would you do that? The way the community has developed systems It basically has four components. You find the face, you take an image, you find where the face is. So there are little pieces of software called face detectors out there. You give it an image, it tells you by identifying a region in the image, a little rectangle where there's probably a face. Once you have that, you fix the face, try and repair all the problems with the quality of the image. Maybe it's blurry, maybe it's dark. Then you take that fixed part of an image and you boil it down into a set of numbers that's hopefully small. And then you develop a procedure to compare the batch of numbers that we just got from your face to similar batches of numbers that were captured from faces that were captured before. Right? So find, fix, represent, compare. And the challenge that I'm going to spend the next few slides on is that this is really hard. The reason I ask you to look at each other's faces is that I can tell by the pattern of lighting out in the audience that there's different amounts of lights that, that are falling on people's faces. People are making different expressions. Uh, the, the coloration of people's faces is different. 
and somehow we recognize faces without worrying about any of those things, but every one of them is a problem for a computer system. So one problem is pie. We call it pie, but it's not the kind you eat. It's pose, illumination, and expression. So the pie problem is well known in computer vision and in, and in uh, biometrics. And the, the challenge, again, is to basically take an image where the face might be turned one way, might be aimed down at the ground, might have a facial expression that is not a neutral, neither smiling nor frowning expression, and, and make it into a neutral expression so it's easier to match. The amount of light that's in the, the area that lands on your face and lights up your face varies from image to image. Getting, having your picture taken by a high quality camera, the light level is quite good. If you're outdoors and someone's taking a picture of you from 50 feet away, perhaps the image is not good at all. Somehow the computer systems that analyze face images have to deal with all those things. There are good techniques out there, lots of work to be done. Age and occlusion and surgery are also factors that we have to take into account when we talk about biometrics on a planetary scale. So in the upper left, we have images of me from about 15 years ago until last week. There's a little bit of age progression there. I could thank my kids for that. Thanks, Daniel. Love you, buddy. Uh, in the upper right, we have uh, three images of people before and after plastic surgery. There are changes to the face. That is the intent of plastic surgery. How are those reflected? How can we account for those when we're matching faces? It's a challenging problem. In the lower left, you see different beard styles for men. There is a, a pattern of hair growth on the male face that is somewhat genetically determined that basically says how much of a beard you can have. Grow the hair as long as you might. You might have patches, you might have areas that where it's very full, and somehow systems have to account for these lifestyle choices that, that allow us to modify the appearance of the face. And then in the lower right is the example of occlusion. We cover up part of the face, the mouth isn't visible, we should still be able to recognize the face, but it's hard, it's a challenge. Cosmetics are also a challenge, right? So there's, there's a lot of interest in recognizing faces that have been made up. The, uh, the problem of identical twins is actually a real fun test for biometric identification systems. If you have a system that can tell two identical twin siblings apart, it's probably a pretty good system, but not many of them can. We've studied this, almost no other groups in, in the world have looked at this, and we have more data than anyone else at Notre Dame. By the way, how many pairs of twins are there in the audience? Put, put your hands up. Not as many as I might expect. I was expecting probably about 20 pairs. That's all right. I've got a twin. I've got a twin sister. She lives in Alameda. Twins are great. So I may have depressed you all, and that was not my intent. This is not a hopeless problem. I'll, I'll talk about the social implications of face recognition in a minute, but I want to convince you that hard problems are what make research labs go. As a researcher, and I'm trying to talk you into becoming researchers, as a researcher you want to find the hard problems. The easy problems are easy. They don't hold your attention, you solve them, you move on. The best place to be in as a researcher is in a place where there are nice hard problems where you can measure progress a little bit at a time and if you keep at it, if you persevere, you can eventually have uh, a very important result at the end. So before I wrap up, I want to talk about two things. One is the CSI effect. So how many people have seen the CSI TV show? Yeah, a good number of you. All right, magic technology. Hit that enhance button a few times. We'll clean up that image. I uh, got bad news for you. There are limits, theory limits, physical limits on how much you can improve images. There are wonderful things that can be done to improve images, but if there's no light in the room, you really can't recover a high fidelity image of the body on the bed. Right? So this shows up a lot in biometric systems in the, that the expectations are really high. As researchers were put it, pushing the limits of performance uh, so that those expectations can be met, but we're a ways away right now. And then finally, the point that, that I think is worth making and worth leaving with you is that biometrics is also a controversial technology, right? These are systems that recognize people. Sometimes the recognition process has a useful purpose, such as 
using a face image or a fingerprint or an iris image to get you access to the cafeteria. So you don't have to remember to bring your card every day, what happens if you forget, go to the office, it's a mess. So somehow it's a lot easier to think of, present your face, get in, get your food, you're done. At the same time, these systems can be used for surveillance. Right? So someone could, could aim a camera at a, a Starbucks coffee shop and capture the face images of all the people that, that go there and use those images for who knows what. So there are potentially beneficial and potentially risky applications of technology, and you're going to see that a lot in research. There's always, there's frequently applications that are, are not as positive as others. And our challenge as a society is to balance those two, to understand when it makes sense to move forward and when we should, for ethical reasons, for reasons of good and bad, not go forward. That's about it. I, I appreciate your attention. I'd be glad to take a couple questions. <laughs> Time for a couple questions. I see a question at the back there. Can't hear the question. I have a question at the back. Please, please stand up. Thank you. So if, if I heard your question, Correctly, it was along the lines of how, how can we as a society make these decisions about whether a technology is appropriate or not? Is that close enough? The way we do this is by educating people about the risks and about the benefits and as a society democratically deciding what the best route is. This, this is definitely uh, a technology and one of many that has good applications and it has not so good applications and we have to make decisions collectively with everyone involved about whether to use them or not use them and what the limits should, should be that are placed on them. There's another question right here. Yes. Great question. That's a wonderful question. So the question, I'll repeat it, is if someone suffers an injury to their face, how can we recognize them from an image that was taken before? The, the general research approach for that specific problem is to make the recognition decision based on parts of the face. So instead of taking a whole image of your face, calculating some numbers from the whole image, we'll take the face first, then we'll isolate the left eye, the right eye, the mouth area, maybe the ears if we can see them, the hairline, and compute little batches of numbers for each of those parts so that if one part is covered up, we still have evidence from the other parts that the identity is correct. Great question. I think I'd, I'd like to stop it here. I'll be d available at the end of the, the session, but we do need to move on. Thank you very much.